Good evening and welcome to the Redwood Library in Athenaeum. I'm Patricia Pettit and I'm the uh, communications uh, officer here at the Redwood. Benedict Lecker, our director, is on vacation this week. We are, we're pleased um, you're joining us tonight to learn more about Bing West's new book, The Last Platoon, a novel of the Afghanistan war. He's a best-selling author and local Newporter. Bing West, a combat Marine and Assistant Secretary of Defense under President Reagan, has written a dozen books about our recent wars. His book with Defense Secretary General Jim Mattis was the number one New York Times bestseller last year. And tonight, he's here to discuss his new novel, The Last Platoon. Now, tonight's lecture is going to operate in a slightly different fashion than we're used to. Um, Mr. West would like it to be more discussion-based and so that you can participate more. Um, for those of you who have been on our lectures in the past, you know there's two ways to ask a question or make a comment. One is ask a question at the bottom of your screen. You can just click on there. And the other is to the right-hand side where it says say something nice. And um, so he'll be monitoring those and engaging you in, in conversation. So it's my pleasure to welcome Bing West and good evening to you, sir. Well, thank, well, thank you. you. And I'd, I'd like, like to thank the Redwood Red for hosting me. me. And uh, I hope that uh, we can keep this lively. And I'd like to begin by, by talking about three different things. I'd like to uh, fundamentally um, talk about what is the nature of writing and then what's the economics of writing and then touch on our, the nature of how we make decisions on our national security and focus on Afghanistan and finally focus on the novel. Let's begin with the nature of writing. George Plimpton, uh, who was a wonderful character while he, while he lived, uh, he had a magazine called the Paris Review Series. And in the 1950s, he set out to interview the most famous writers and sculptors and artists in the world. And what he discovered almost universally was that they worked for about four to five hours a day and then they were exhausted. And when you think of it, the brain is a muscle like any other muscle, and it wears down. And it wears down particularly if you have a blank sheet of paper that you have to fill every day, or a piece of canvas with your idea of what this piece of art is going to be, but you have nothing there until you get to work. And on average, a very good writer who's disciplined will write 700 words a day. And then after getting a first draft done of about 100,000 words, that writer will spend 600 words a day changing the 700 words. And he'll go through, or she will go through one draft, two drafts, three drafts. And after about four drafts, you begin to have something that you begin to believe could be published. So if you have sons or daughters or grandsons or granddaughters, I'd be very careful if, if they say they want to be writers because it's a lonely life. <laughs> There's just you and that blank piece of paper. And as I'll get into in a moment, uh, the economics aren't particularly uh, salutary. But I have to say that we'll always have writers because a writer or a sculptor or an artist, it's in the DNA. You are born with it and you know it. And therefore, if you're not doing it, your conscience bothers you. But it is nothing, nothing but hard, disciplined work. There are no shortcuts to it. So on average, if you're going to write a book, you're pretty good if you can write a book in two years. One is to shape the book. And then the second, which I'll now shift to, is the economics of writing. 
And what happens if you're a writer? And there are two ways that you go about writing. One is fiction and the other is nonfiction, obviously. I've done both. In, in fiction, what you're after is developing characters that by about the third or fourth month when you're working with them, run away with what they want to do. You no longer control them. You think you do, but you don't. And what you're trying to do is tell a story about human nature. And we're all interested in stories. We all love gossip about ourselves because we're, we're social animals and therefore what makes us tick. And it is in fiction that you can cause that to come alive. In nonfiction, you get sued. <laughs> so in nonfiction, you have to stay pretty close to the truth rather than what you want to expose about character. But fiction is primarily now uh, mostly female writers and the audience is mostly females between the ages of 40 and 75. That makes it hard for, for an old fart Marine like me who is, you know, nobody's going to, I, I'm not, I'm not kind of big on, on the romance and um, the sex doesn't really get in there. And in fact, um, my wife burst out laughing about it. And my, my agent said, we're not even going to think of putting that in your novel. So that was the end of that. Um, but I wanted to tell a story about character. Now, the other part is nonfiction. There, you can do well, but again, again, a plumber is going to do better by the hour being paid than a writer. But in nonfiction, the big trend has been for the last three years that the publishing houses now have gone after big names, gossip books, that will have a splash beginning and people will pay 25 to 28 dollars to skim through something looking for a couple of juicy paragraphs about i don't know what president trump said to uh, senator schumer or something and and that's it and then it's gone it's it's like cotton candy but the publishing houses say that's how they keep afloat now, there are now about five really big publishing houses. They keep gobbling each other up. So then when you go in with a manuscript, you no longer have 12 or 14 different publishing houses that are bidding on it. What you have is one bid from each of the major publishing houses. They don't allow, for instance, Penguin and Random House are both part of the same publishing house. And I used to get a bid from one and the other. And now they say, no, 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 internally we'll decide and there'll just be one bid. So if you're an author, you're kind of stuck that uh, you're, the, the vertical publishing um, kind of drives down the amount of money they, they, they'll pay you. Um, the, the other interesting thing about where we're going with publishing is that Amazon is the 600-pound gorilla that sooner or later the publishers are, live in mortal fear is going to just say, that's it, from now on, I'm going to be the publisher. And Amazon has fantastic data, as we all know, on every single one of us in our spending habits and in our reading habits. They do not share that with the publishers, but they have it. So if they wanted to get into this line of work, that would dramatically change the industry. But so far they've withheld, I think, because the margins on books are very small compared to the regular margins that Amazon is looking for. On books, you're looking at margins, hey, if you're lucky, anywhere from 5 to 10%, whereas uh, in most items, you're looking at uh, margins of 20 to 40%. But sooner or later, Amazon may pounce. They're, they're, they're experimenting a little bit now about publishing a few of their own, but pretty much they've left publishing have itself 
the way it wants to. But if they want to change the rules of the game, wow. So most young writers now are not into writing. They are into scripts. And most of them move out to the West Coast, especially to Los Angeles, because the explosiveness of the video streaming causes an insatiable appetite for different soap operas. And that pays, gee, 10 times more than sitting down to write a book. Um, I don't know what the long-term trend is on this, but the other side, I have to say that in America, we read more per capita than any other nation in the world. I'm sorry, we're second. The United Kingdom is first, we are second. But many of the other countries in the world just don't, don't, don't read. I mean, I know that because you, you, you sign a lot of, oh, you know, such and such a country wants to have, publish a book, blah, 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 and you end up with 500 sales. Um, the, we in America, in the United States, have something like 15,000 books every year that are, that are published. Now, about half of them are self-published, but it does speak to our literacy as a nation that we in the United Kingdom lead the rest of the world. So let me now move from the background about writing to when you're writing about national security, as I have for the last two, 60 years. Um, what, what do you learn about how we make our decisions as Americans relative to national security? And I would have to say that the, the, the factor that has struck me more than any other variable has been the enormous power that has accrued to the White House, regardless of whether it's Democrat or Republican. I, I've had the honor of going to the White House many times. And when you go to the White House and you enter into the Oval Office, the, the power suffuses from the, from the walls where you have um, the, the great portraits of the last 200 years. And then the carpets are very thick. And then there is a discreet Secret Service man here or there. And then you walk in and you know you are in the seat of power. And what happens, I believe, is that people who, who live in that rarefied air are inside a bubble that they're not aware of where they come to honestly believe that they can make better decisions. And if you look at Vietnam, if you look at Iraq, if you look at Afghanistan, I would much prefer that it be some of you who, who uh, attend some of the discussions at the Redwood who are commonsensical, who have a larger view that we're making these decisions than the people who gather in the room to make the decisions. Um, and many of those people are my friends, but something happens. Um, and the military has to be very careful of this because as you grow in rank in the military, you accumulate around you other people who hope that you can help their careers. You also determine that there are some people that you'd like to have there. And you too gradually have a staff that is so devoted to you that you have to be careful you don't get a swelled head and, and think that because you're a four star you're making the right decisions. And of all the on all the books I've written about Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, what bothered me the most was that many of the critical decisions were made by people at the top that hadn't taken the time to reflect carefully about what they were doing, but were dead certain they were right. Um, and too much power resides inside the White House. Now, part of that is the fault of the Congress, that the Congress, because it is so split, has not entered into rational debate about many of these subjects. 
I don't know what the solution to this is, but but I, I do feel that in national security, too much power resides in the White House. Then let me go to Afghanistan, which relates to that. From the very, I've, wow. I don't know, I guess throughout my career, I've been in combat maybe 12, 14 years over, over that time and hundreds of patrols. I'm just lucky uh, that, that I'm still here. That, that's just sheer luck. But from the start when I was in Afghanistan and I was out with the different platoons, they all like the old guy coming out with them. And then afterwards they'll say, how'd I do, sir? And I always say, yeah, you did all right. <laughs> you don't want them to think they did spectacular. Uh, but I was, because in Vietnam, I had a combined action platoon of Marines and farmers. And we lived for over a year in a Vietnamese village, 14 Marines, 15 Marines, and 5,000 Vietnamese. And from that experience and spending years there, I came away realizing how devilishly complex it is for, for anyone to go into another country and, and think you're going to change them. You can, if you're willing to do what we did in South Korea and stay there for 70 years. But there you get back to the people who are advising the president, and this I feel very strongly about, and the, the military I don't think does a good job of this, should say to that president, Mr. President, you are about to undertake a course of action with combat, and the probability is 99% you cannot conclude that while you are president. So you are committing the nation, you are committing the Congress, and you're committing your successor to do what you think is right now. Now, that's really hard to say. I mean, can you imagine saying that to a president? But that's the truth. Uh, and nobody said it. And, and so what happened in Afghanistan, I, I believe that uh, President Bush um, genuinely thought he was doing a good thing. I mean, he did. Uh, some of the statements he made, uh, he, he was an evangelical Christian. He is. But I think he got a little bit confused between his spiritual beliefs and his generosity of spirit versus the national security of the United States when he said, we owe freedom to the Afghans and the Iraqis. I, I didn't think that we really did. But once we went down that path, and I was in Afghanistan, I, I realized we were out here with a bunch of tribes hurtling headlong into the ninth century. And you'd be out there with a platoon Army or Marine, their average age is about 22. Uh, they're all carrying rifles, and you only do one thing with a rifle. You shoot somebody. And, and so that's what they were. They're out there to be lethal. They're out there to be killers, killers of the enemy. But the idea that they were going to drink tea with the, with the village sheikhs, and then those, those village elders would say, ah, now we see the light, I always thought was daffy. But we continued it year after year after year. And so against that background, I come to my book. May I have the, the first of the PowerPoint slides, please? And what I wanted to do in this, and it took me two years, but what I wanted to do in the novel was to take everything that I had learned over 60 years on these battlefields and try to make it an interesting story. Um, and, and I'll get to that in a second, but what I'd like to do is first show you the terrain and then what I thought would be the story. May I have the next slide, please? So this is really where the, the action in this novel takes place is in southern Afghanistan in a place called Sangin, which is really a bloody place. But when you look at this, you realize there's, there's one river, 
and everyone lives along the banks of the river. And so this could be any bucolic countryside setting, uh, I don't know, in the middle of Kansas or something, uh, except for a few differences. May I have the next slide, please? And this is your typical platoon. Uh, in this particular case, there are 40 of them. But you take one look at them and, and you see a few things. They're young, they're cocky, they're in great shape, and they're willing to fight. And I found that wherever I went. Um, these weren't your shrinking violets. These were Marines. I may have the next slide, please. And, and this was the people that we were dealing with. This, I think this one was classic. So we, we're going along one day, and we're in a bazaar. And we had this device that enables you to know if somebody has a cell phone. That's all I'll say about it, you know, but it's, it's pretty clever. So we, we knew that this terrorist had a cell phone, but we didn't want to give away that we had a device that enabled us, us to grab them because then they would figure out, oh, did she, you know. So we grabbed some people at random from the market, and the person we wanted has, is, is the thick black beard at the end, um, and then we lined up the others next to him, and then we were going to search them and accidentally find the cell phone. Well, what he did was he reached into his pocket and handed the cell phone to the next Afghan who handed it to the next, who handed it to the next, not knowing that, that we were watching this whole thing and knowing that we were watching a cell phone moving along. And then finally we stopped the charade and, and arrested him. But you know what drove, that drove home to me? I'm convinced that that terrorist that we were after did not know these other people. We just picked them out at random. But when he had something to hide, the others instinctively helped him. And right then I said, what are we doing here? The, 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 we're dealing with tribes. May I have the next slide, please? And this is typical when you're going, when you're moving in combat, you're, you're in a line and you're using your rifle, all of the rifles have telescopic sights to look around to see where the enemy might be and when he's going to take a shot at you. May the next slide, please. And wherever you go, you find this. Now, this is, this is Corporal Yazi. Yaz was uh, a Navajo Indian who was terrific as our engineer. He had a sense. He had a sense for where the landmines called the improvised explosive devices were. And we were supposed to walk next to this wall and he said, stop. And he went forward and he, you can see him crouching over and sure enough, he found one of the mines. On the average day that I'd be out with this platoon, Yazzie would find two to three mines waiting in places where you wouldn't expect them. And unfortunately in the end, Yazzie lost his leg. May I have the next slide please? Now, the enemy is quite bold in certain ways. Um, this one, you're looking through a telescopic site, and you see up in the right below where it says enemy, you, you see that um, reticule there. You can see that there are three men moving along, and then you draw back. They were about 600 meters from us, and they were moving from one compound to another. And this happens very, very frequently, that they'll dart in and out of different compounds. Next slide, please. And we wouldn't stay long in the kill zones after, after a firefight, and we killed some people. But uh, this is typical of what a terrorist, what, what's one of the absolute radicals looks like. And, and they have bandanas on their forehead with, with different religious inscriptions and many of them are true true believers in their radical islam you have the next slide please and so i said to myself a couple of years ago i want to tell a story i want to tell people what afghanistan was really like 
but not lecture. Just just bring them with me, put them with this platoon, and let the reader understand what's going on. So I try to tell the story from four points of view. First, I have about 40 Marines that are in the fight with a couple of very good CIA people, uh, special operators. And they are aligned against the local Taliban, but what they don't know is that the whole place has relationships to the drug lords, and all the farmers are growing poppy. And the last thing they want are these Marines being there, even temporarily, because it interferes with their commerce. And then I try to trace back how the Taliban are nurtured by Afghanistan, by Pakistan that is only 80 miles away, and how the drugs move out of Afghanistan and they flow into Pakistan and then into Iran, and from Iran they go up through Serbia into Russia and Western Europe. And so you're out there fighting, and at one point, uh, in the novel, I have uh, one of the CIA operatives, he's talking with one of the Marine sergeants, and the Marine sergeant said, boy, these poor people, they're out there trying to pick those tiny little bulbs to get the heroin and the poppy, and it's just just really tough work. And the CIA operative bursts out laughing, and he said, sergeant, you're looking at fields of gold. They could be raising many crops here but they get paid very, very well for raising the poppy. And this is the entire society down in southern Afghanistan. And so at the other, on the other part of the novel, I try to bring the reader all the way up to the White House because the White House had sent them out there. And then I try to show what the president and the secretary of defense and the director of the CIA what they're looking at as this fight evolves today, it's a, it's, it's a today fight. And of course, they don't want any casualties. They don't even want those Marines to be there for more than a couple of days to help out. Then they're supposed to scoot out of there and we're supposed to get out of Afghanistan. And as you can imagine, everything begins to cascade and get out of hand. Uh, thank you. That's the end of the slides. And what I try to do in the book, I try to bring the reader into the minds and watch what a 22-year-old sergeant is doing and what he's thinking, what the 35-year-old captain is doing and what he's thinking, what the Taliban is doing, because the interesting thing, and you know this only if you're if you're a grunt, if you're if you're an infantryman. You, you learn this pretty darn fast. Do you know when when you go out any place, there are other people out there that think they're going to kill you, and the first thing you have to really beat in your troops is this is no cakewalk. You make a mistake and you are dead. You're going home, and that is it. And you have to inculcate in them that these Taliban are out there and they, have, they, they think they're going to win. They don't think you're going to win. They're going to beat you. And so if you're the sergeant and you're in charge of eight Marines, you have to keep your head on a swivel and you have to be thinking all the time. And then the captain has to be dealing with higher headquarters, trying to f figure out when he has to need help. And in this particular case, his higher headquarters this is typical in any organization in the world, any business. He has a colonel at the base, and the colonel wants to make general. So the colonel has ambitions. So the colonel isn't out in the fight, and the colonel is trying to figure out why are they taking casualties? Why are they shooting people? And the colonel then has to report to Washington, and Washington is sort of saying, whoa, we just lost another Marine. They're out there shooting people. We didn't think any of this was going to happen because they're so far from the battlefield. 
they have no comprehension what's going on, but they think they're in charge. And one of the interesting things that's cropped up, and I, I think in future combat, we just have to stop it. They all have televideo just like we do. And so every day the president, if he wants, and they did, I mean, a lot of times during the combat this would happen, the president would call up somebody and say, hey, what's going on? And it would be a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the ambassador. Then the ambassador would call up the general, and the general would call up the colonel, and they'd all be, 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 be talking. Uh, I don't think you should fight a war that way. You, you, you know, you don't need 6,000 mile screwdrivers. But I, I try in the novel to show the different frames of reference and what the president is concerned about, what the Secretary of Defense is concerned about, what the director of the CIA is concerned about, and how that dribbles down and, and walks back up to the platoon in the fight. But that's only half of it. Then I try to get into the other half. I mentioned that the Taliban think they're going to win. They are winning, and they are absolutely ruthless. They truly believe in their religiosity and in the idea that they're going to have victory. And they are, they are tough, uh, but they'll kill anyone. And what has happened is that Pakistan for 20 years has been the succor and the aider of the Taliban. And so I don't think you could ever win a war if you gave them a sanctuary. So I try to tie the Taliban in to the people in Pakistan and Iran who are profiting from the drugs. I try to put all that in a novel that only goes for seven days from the start to the end, seven days, and that's it. Now, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take a couple of, uh, a couple, I noticed a couple of questions here, and I'll go to them. Um, as Here's one. Richard said that as a retired foreign service officer, I believe we need to not use our military for every problem overseas. With an open border with Pakistan, right. Centuries of tribalism, right. Drugs, right. In extreme poverty, this war was never winnable. And Afghanistan was never going to be made into a developed democracy. Well, Richard, you, you, you and I could write the book together. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you summarized it in, in, in one paragraph. But at the same time, therefore, in, in the novel, I try to, knowing all this, I, I try, to, try to show how a Secretary of Defense can get so confused because we had several Secretaries of Defense like Bob Gates who, who you know, would kind of agree with everything, Richard, that you said, and yet he kept fighting that war that way. And so I try, I try to show how confused it can get at the top and an awful lot of wishful thinking. Tell us, and here's another one, uh, please tell us about the role of the interpreters during combat and how these relationships change after leaving the country. Wow. Uh, my heart goes out to them. Um, let me start in Vietnam, and then Iraq, and then Afghanistan. And it, it, it's not good news. We, in my judgment, we let down the Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese. We cut off their aid, and then we would not bomb when they were attacked by the North. And when South Vietnam fell, there was an exit, the sea. Do you know that in the first couple of weeks in 1975 and in May, during May of 75, we brought out over 200,000, 200,000 Vietnamese coming to the United States. Every one of our ships was just packed with them because the, 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 that aspect of the South China Sea doesn't have waves. It's not like going out here in Block Island Sound. It is flat. 
So they were coming out in canoes. They were coming out in anything. 200,000 people climbing onto our ships. And then over time, over the next several years, everyone kept exiting. So over, over 1 million Vietnamese now live in Western Europe or the United States. 1 million. Now let me go to Iraq. Iran and Iraq was falling apart. We, all the interpreters who worked for us, had to fill out papers. And regardless of how many lieutenants and sergeants and majors would say, Aqua is a terrific guy. The State Department ran the program. And the problem was there and now with Afghanistan, they're all worried because they're all bureaucrats. They're all worried if you're the one who signs off a piece of paper for Aqua, and it turns out Aqua is a terrorist who's very clever, and then he sets off a bomb, you as the bureaucrat, eventually it's going to get down to you and your career and your reputation is shattered. Now, what are the odds of that happening? I mean, you could say maybe one in a hundred thousand, enough that it shut down the program. So the I managed to get out one of the interpreters from Iraq. You know how I did it in the end? I had to go to the four-star general in charge of Iraq and say, do me a favor. I'm, 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 I'm going to swear by this guy. And he's turned out terrific. But that's how I had to, I mean, that's crazy. Now you go to Afghanistan. Last, no, I guess it was almost a month ago now, um, a retired sergeant major from the Army and his interpreter came to see me. Uh, John is the name of the interpreter. And uh, I had done the same thing. For, for John about, golly, now about 10 years ago after we after I was leaving, he wanted to get on the plane with the Army platoon to come back. And, they, the, the Army, and John is fascinating, and he's classic of those Afghans who stood with us. When John now is only about 24, but when, when he, st- he said that when we invaded, he was eight years of age, and some some soldiers were walking by the house, American soldiers. They gave him some candy. They, you know, patted him on the head and kidded with him. He was so awed, he ran in, and they had a small black and white television in the house, and he began to watch American soaps. And by the time he was 14, he thought he knew enough to apply for a job as an interpreter. He, he went to this company who was hiring them, and they, it turns out he... His English was awful, but he thought it was pretty good. But he really knew very little. They turned him down, of course, and he was underage. Then he came back when he was 15 with forged papers. They were desperate for interpreters. They said, all right, go ahead, send him out to this platoon where I met him. But when I met him, he'd been there for two years now living with the, with the soldiers. So he had quite a vocabulary by this time. But the sergeant major who was here was telling a funny story that here he is when he's on his first patrols with the Marines and they're going into villages and he's 15 and and they would have him talking to the village elders. And John said, the village elders would say to me, kid, what are you doing with these? these? These are bad people you're with, kid. Can you get me some money? And they would they would browbeat him. They do different things. And he had... No way. And the sergeant would be saying, what are they saying? What are they saying? And his English was so bad. The only thing he could say is when he was finished with with the meeting was he good man or he not good man. (laughs) And if he said he not good man, he had to run and hide behind the sergeant. Well, we, we got John out, but he was here at my house and he was telling me that his sister was shot in the stomach about a month ago. His brother in law was executed by the Taliban and his seven-year-old nephew was executed and his family is on the run because what's happened inside the society 
is that now everyone believes the Taliban are going to win, and they're saying that that family, that family worked with the Americans, so they're turning on each other. Another one, Larry Davis says, I seem to recall driving you when I was a sailor at the War College in the 70s. Did you teach there? Yeah, I did. I had a great time, Larry. Uh, um, I, I was dean of research at, at the Naval War College and, uh, you know, had a chance to do the 10-mile the, the, the runs and, you know, as, I mean, you know, semi-athletic scholarship. And we had a, you know, I shouldn't put it that way. You, you get a good education at the War College. They work very, very hard, but you have a chance to work out every day. So, I mean, it was, it, it was, I really enjoyed my time at the War College. Uh, Richard's back again. He said, what is coming in Afghanistan will be tragic. But the tragedy was being born in Afghanistan. Women across the border in Pakistan, also Pashto, have no more freedom than women in Afghanistan under the Taliban. Correct. Pakistan has the highest number of honor killings in the world. Look, Richard, what, I mean, I mean, there are, everyone wants to say good things about different religions, etc., but but the fundamentalists in the Islamic religion have, have done a terrible job toward the women and continue to do so. And Pakistan is, is uh, I'm just going to say it, Pakistan is a devious country. Um, most nations have armies, and people like to say, um, but in, in Pakistan, the army has a nation. They run everything. And do you know there is no income tax in Pakistan? You ask, well, where do they get their money? They're freeloaders all the time, bailed out by somebody. But they're schizophrenic. They 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 split. They were split from in 1948 or 49, and a huge, huge struggle versus in the Hindus versus the the. Um, Islam and millions were murdered on both sides. Pakistan, Pakistan hates India, but India is vibrant. India is trying to do something. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. It aids the Taliban, but it's not trying to do anything. It's not trying to do anything. So it's people, and and they've made they 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 they've they've made deals with the devil. So I'm I'm not a big believer in in Pakistan and the poor women in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, it's disgraceful what's happening. Is it, um, J. Richard Dermas, is it possible for you to comment how the average very young Marine or soldier with slim background knowledge views the mission in Afghanistan? Uh, I, I know, you know, hundreds of them, uh, and I get a lot of emails and phone calls, blah, blah, blah. They're, and I hate to speak for everybody, but in general, they're not that young. On average, they're 22, and they come, 75% of all Americans in our youth cannot qualify for the military. They're, they do not have, they cannot pass the IQ test. They cannot pass the character tests. They cannot pass the physicals. Isn't that scary about America? We're down to 25%. And of that 25%, less than 1% actually volunteer. So it's a very, very small group. Then if you go into the infantry, where you're referring to them when out in the villages where I was with them, gee, that's maybe one in 20 that have volunteered, you know, so you start and you get down to a tiny little group. When that group is out there, they're on their, they're their own little tribes. That's what I try to bring out in the book, the last platoon. This platoon was tight. Um, and they, they get it. They understood. I would say the vast majority of, of these young men who, who were out in the villages, they, they'd say, yeah, being like, yeah, sure, we know what you're saying because you've written several books about it because you're with us. Hello. <laughs> so 
but they would also say in the I, I have the platoon commander in the book saying this in the novel none of us would doubt a great hand in life well, you, you know so what do you do you do your best at what you were dealt with so they decided they wanted to be in the military they decided they wanted to be grunts they wanted to be the guys way out in the point and i did a survey of one platoon of uh, 52 48 said i'd like to be right here and of the 52 before we were finished we had two killed nine amps nine amputations and 17 gunshot wounds and they still wanted to be there because they felt they were doing something and they, they, they felt empowered by what they were doing. The interesting thing is that when you then bring them back and separate them out from their unit, that's when you start bumping into this post-traumatic stress stuff. A lot is if every day a Marine or a soldier is told, okay, you're going to get up at 0500, you're going to pack your kit, I'm going to check your weapon, you're going to have this sector, you're going to do this, that, or the other thing, and then when he shows a little mat maturity, he becomes a corporal, and he's trying to teach four others what to do, everything is regimented. Uh, but it's regimented in a way by peer group pressure. You don't want anyone slacking up. Then when he comes back, oh, that's taken away, and he's out there again by himself. Uh, I don't quite know how many, but, but an awful lot of them who do very well as long as they're regimented. And then they say, well, I can't, get, can't wait to get back to civilian land. Once they're back there, they don't do as well. Some have the internal discipline. Others, the discipline was enforced upon them. And they did well when the discipline was enforced upon them. I would have to say as a whole that those who fought there would are torn. On the one hand, they'd say, I did my job. But on the other hand, I think probably most of them would say, I saw this coming, that, that the Afghan government didn't put it together. We put these soldiers and Marines um, in impossible situations. Captains arrive in Afghanistan with next to no knowledge of culture, language, religion, history, tribal feuds, find themselves negotiating between tribal leaders that have fought each other for centuries. Truly absurd. And I have felt so much for these poor Americans doing their best to follow orders with absolutely no role in determining the desired end state they are seeking. Yeah, okay. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing written there that I, I, I needed a collaborator for the novel. We could have. But in the novel, I, I try then to get into the character. Given that you know all this, what do you do when, you, when you're there? You try to keep your people alive, and you try to carry out your mission. Now, the mission for this platoon was very, very simple that I made it, because it's what we've been doing now for the last several years. They were simply providing a little bit of artillery support for a short amount of time for the Afghan soldiers that were fighting. The Marines weren't supposed to be doing the fighting. That came about by accident that they were there, and once they were there, whoa, whoa, whoa. But the idea that they didn't understand the tribes, et cetera, they'd all agree with you. They'd say, yeah, that's right. That's right. But I was told to come out here. I was told to help with the artillery, and that's what I'm doing. And in the end, it all comes down to a fight. Um, maybe, there, maybe there were a couple of days when I was on patrol when we weren't shot at over the years I've been in combat, but not many. Not many. Uh, if you go out there with a small group of Americans in Vietnam, Iraq, or Afghanistan, you're out there to fight the enemy, and the enemy is trying to kill you, and you're trying to kill him. And that causes your mind to be very, very focused on the job. Um, other questions?
Well, if if there aren't any, I uh, I'll let you all go early so you can, you can get in there. That was just fascinating and and certainly timely. And I thank you so so much. And I assume we can purchase your book from the normal channels. And if anyone would like to have it autographed, could you tell us how and share that information? Oh, I'm happy to delight. You know, you know, you know. Okay, they could reach out to us, and 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 we'll um and we'll take the request and pass it on to you. Oh, sure. It's a great, great reading, reading, by the way. I guarantee you, you start reading, reading this book, you're going to get into the character. Because everything we're talking about is geopolitics, but it's not how we act. We act as human beings with, with different motivations, and that's what I'm going to get into. How do you act when you're put into this situation? And some did it, some did it. I, I would close by. I, I, I sent the book out to, to some four-star four generals, generals, and I got, I got a, a, a really, I got, got someone who came back to me and said, I think this is a great, great book. book. And I got, got someone who came back and said, damn, damn it, man. You, 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 you know too much, much, and people are going to think this is really the way things are. are. And we don't have friends like that. that. Well, yes, we do, because that person is my turn out the end. And, and I, I, I said, said to this one first time general, we were saying, saying, you know, we're, we're really better than that. And, and I, I said, said general, general, there was, there was a, a great, great, great novel called King by Henry Walk in World, World War II. II. And they and asked the Chief Naval Operations, famous Admiral King, King, what did he think about that book about a mutiny? And he and thought to him, and he said, well, at one time or another, in my 40 years in the Navy, I've met every one of those sons of bitches, but not all of them on one ship at one time. Well, thank you so, so much. And um, we, um, we appreciate your taking the time and sharing that with us. Well, thank, thank you very you much for having me. Really no, appreciate you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So tomorrow night, I'd like to invite you, really changing the, the tempo here, um, to come along to our Sounds from the Big Chair. I don't know if any of you have yet uh, been over to the Redwood to see the 19-foot the, uh, Windsor chair, rocking chair on our front lawn. Um, but it's being used as a stage for some, some lovely, fun concerts this summer. They're free, and you're invited to come along and bring a picnic, your chairs, and, and enjoy it. I think the weather promises to cooperate with us tomorrow evening. And we're having a group called So Soul. It's a, a folk group that has a vintage sound, and it has roots in both Tropicalia and Americana. So um, come along if you'd like to, just register on our website as always, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Thank you very much for joining us and good evening.